1945, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, large parts of Europe are totally destroyed. Areas where there was Allied fighting look like post-apocalyptic landscapes. And throughout Europe, you have these bands of refugees, large groups of people just wandering. And there's just total privation, a total lack of food. In this context, where you have a divided Germany with military occupation going on by the Allied forces, there's this big urgent question, which is what do we do with these high-ranking Nazi officials that orchestrated, architected, and carried out the destruction of World War II? At one point or another, all the major Allied forces, FDR, Stalin, Churchill, they all expressed support for doing a summary execution, a kind of show trial to just round up these war criminals and eliminate them. And in this context, a remarkable decision was eventually arrived upon. It did not come easy. There was a lot of infighting and a lot of persuading that had to be done, but they eventually decided to do this international tribunal that was the Nuremberg trials. The head of the American prosecution team at Nuremberg was a man named Robert H. Jackson. Robert H. Jackson was a justice on the United States Supreme Court, and he understood this to be really the job, the appointment of a lifetime. The different allied prosecution teams had to negotiate and figure out what the indictments would be, and they eventually hit upon four indictments, uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes, uh, wars of aggression, and the fourth one, which is the most interesting one, is this indictment of conspiracy. All four of these indictments stood on very, very shaky legal ground. There was no real legal foundation for any indictments um, because there was no real international law at this point. There was no precedent really to work with. But of all the indictments, the conspiracy one was the most novel and strange and hard to understand. And that was championed by Robert H. Jackson. And historians have looked at it and have concluded that maybe Robert H. Jackson was very influenced by uh, court cases that he saw against like mob bosses in America, where they get a you know, gangster on the crime of conspiracy. But on, on a more simple level, what the indictment of conspiracy speaks to is it speaks to the sense that Jackson looked around at the carnage, at the devastation, at the destruction that he saw across Europe. And he came to the reasonable conclusion that this must have been premeditated. That for something like this to happen, many powerful people had to have planned it out and thought deeply about it and orchestrated and constructed this outcome. Robert H. Jackson was known for being a really skilled orator. And he opened the Nuremberg trials. And he opened them as follows. Quote, the wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. End quote. And the key word in that sentence that I just read is the word calculated. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated because for Robert H. Jackson, that was the essence of his understanding of the Holocaust, of World War II, of the Nazi war crimes. He continued, skipping, quote, in the prisoner's dock sit 20 odd broken men, reproached by the humiliation of those they have led almost as bitterly as by the desolation of those they have attacked. Their personal capacity for evil is forever past. It is hard now to perceive in these men as captives the power by which as Nazi leaders they once dominated much of the world and terrified most of it. Merely as individuals, their fate is of little consequence to the world. What makes this inquest significant is that these prisoners represent sinister influences that will lurk in the world long after their bodies have returned to dust. We will show them to be living symbols of racial hatreds, of terrorism and violence, and of the arrogance and cruelty of power. They are symbols of fierce nationalism and of militarism, of intrigue and war-making which have embroiled Europe 
generation after generation, crushing its manhood, destroying its homes, and impoverishing its life. End quote. And with that, the Nuremberg trials opened, and it was a spectacle. It was incredibly theatrical. It was the first time in the history of the world that there was this simultaneous translation system where the press and the defendants and the different lawyers and legal teams could listen in on headsets and get a live translation of what was ever going on in the courtroom. And the whole world watched with bated breath what would happen in this amazing moment this history-making experiment. And so what happened? What happened to these 24 defendants, the most high-ranking officials that the Allied forces were able to secure? Of course, Hitler had committed suicide, Goebbels had committed suicide, uh, Himmler had committed suicide in, in prison, uh, all the high-ranking Nazi officials that were with Hitler, many of them that were with Hitler in the bunker committed suicide. But these were what were left, and these had huge resumes. Uh, on this docket were high-ranking high generals, uh, people who were uh, named as Hitler's successor, high members of the, the Nazi Reich, and people who ruled in Poland and Lithuania. So what happened to these, to these men in Nuremberg? The amazing thing, the startling thing, is that only 12 got a death sentence. Martin Bormann was tried and convicted in abstentia, uh, being that his whereabouts were unknown, and Goering uh, committed suicide a few hours before he was let out to be hung, and so only 10, 10 Nazis were killed um, based on the conviction, which means that 12 of the defendants were either exonerated or given much lighter sentences, ranging from 10 years in prison, some got 20 years in prison, and I think a few got life in prison and those sentences uh, often got mitigated, which is a shock, which is a shock. These are people that if they were just left in Germany with no trial, would probably have been lynched by the newly erected German government that was um, forming at the time. These are people who allied forces were talking about just summarily executing in public, and 12 of them managed to be able to avoid a death sentence at Nuremberg. And so how did this happen? What do we learn from this experience? Well, uh, one of the things that came out is that actually a lot of titles in the Nazi government were quite honorary, that people held very, very high-ranking titles that sounded uh, very impressive, but they actually had no power. Um, a lot of people, to the shock of the prosecution team and to the shock of the press and the media that were in the room watching this in the world, many of them claimed to, to not know what was happening. They claimed to have no idea about the concentration camps, about the death camps. And they were able to argue con convincingly. They were, the prosecution was not able to convince the judges that these people knew. Many people argued at Nuremberg that they played a mitigating force, that they held these positions of power and they sought to be more humane than the government, than the edicts that were being passed down by the Fuhrer. And so the big drama of the Nuremberg trials and the, the story, the arc of Robert H. Jackson is that Robert H. Jackson went into Nuremberg with the firm conviction that a nation like Germany can't just blunder into World War II. You can't just blunder accidentally into a Holocaust. And the story of the Nuremberg trials is this revelation that actually you can, that it doesn't actually require the kind of premeditation that Robert H. Jackson thought it did. One of the most dramatic moments at Nuremberg, this very theatrical event, was the cross-examination of Hermann Goering. Goering was the uh, head of the Luftwaffe, which was the German Air Force. And of all the defendants in Nuremberg, he was the least repentant. He felt strongly that history would vindicate the Nazi project. He maintained his allegiance to Hitler at a time when most of the defendants, the vast majority of the defendants, were expressing uh, more, much more remorse and they regretted uh, following, following Hitler.
And this was the face-off between the American prosecution team, Robert H. Jackson, cross-examining Hermann Goring. I'm reading here from a book called The Nuremberg Trial by John Tusa and Ann Tusa. Quote, Once Goring settled in the witness box, his stage fright went, and he seemed almost relaxed. The official films show him quite still, for the most part, reserving gestures with his right arm to color key passages in his statement. There is a noticeable lack of theatricality in his testimony, the underplaying, perhaps, of a good actor. Throughout his examination, he directed few glances at the tribunal. He addressed most of his answers to his lawyer. Only occasionally did he look round the room to check the response and to involve his audience. He carried his thick wad of notes, but needed no more than a quick reference to prompt his next passage or refresh his memory on details. He was proud of this. It is all from memory. You would be surprised how few Q words I have jotted down to guide me. Skipping a bit, we now get a description of Jackson's performance in the cross-examination. Quote, Jackson began slack and slow on his feet. He dragged through the early history of Nazism, the policies with which the party had gained control over Germany, the indictments with which he no doubt hoped to illustrate the criminality. The Times correspondent and others were amazed that he should spend so much time on such side issues. It seemed a clear tactical mistake to allow Goring to warm up before introducing the more vital charges on which the main case was based. But then, Jackson had always seen the entire prosecution case teleologically, the final crimes being implicit in the very origins of the regime. Whether the issues were well chosen or not, Jackson did not use them effectively. He skipped from one topic to another, using little or no documentary evidence to support the allegations he was making. His questions were general and imprecise. Goring seized them, condescendingly divided them into more specific sections, then dealt with each at great length. He was parrying Jackson with ease and taking opportunity to repeat all the justifications, all the boasts he had made in his examination in chief. Jackson became increasingly irritated as Goring avoided direct answers. The official film shows him jabbing his pen into the rostrum or turning it over and over in mounting agitation as Goring's rhetoric gained force. This is a very long section of the book, and the authors give many different reasons to explain how Jackson could have performed so badly. Uh, and eventually, after, after going through all the testimony and this whole story, they sum up this episode of Nuremberg as follows. Quote, No single explanation will finally settle the question of what went wrong with Jackson's cross-examination of Goering. The answer consists of a blend of the possible ingredients according to individual taste. It is, however, clear that the impact of his failure was a personal tragedy for Robert Jackson, overshadowing the rest of his time at Nuremberg. Only in his final speech did the old mastery and passion revive. Until then, he behaved like Achilles in his tent, bitter, impatient with the trial, and irreconcilably estranged. End quote. And he goes on to give examples of the personal enmity between Jackson and the other lawyers. And so, ultimately, the story of the Nuremberg Trials is well encapsulated by this tragedy of Robert H. Jackson. The shocking revelation that it doesn't require a conspiracy to create that kind of devastation. It doesn't require foreplanning. It doesn't require brilliance. It doesn't require extensive coordination and collaboration. It takes regular people failing to be courageous. Another one of the aspects that came to light during the Nuremberg trials is the way the German people lived in an, in a, in an epistemological fog, which to many of us might seem very foreign. You know, I feel very confident that I can understand what's happening in the world. Whereas these Nazis they describe living in a total fog. They said, my country put out propaganda. I couldn't trust what was being said on the radio. I had no idea what was happening in Germany. 
And then when the prosecution would ask, well, what about you had access to all the foreign media that was reporting on atrocities in Poland and throughout Europe? Why didn't you listen to that? Why, why, why wasn't that, uh, why, why aren't you culpable? Because you had access to information. They would say, it was anti-German propaganda. They would say, which is the same thing as saying it's fake news, it's biased, you know, and, and they were right. You know, how can you argue against that? These are the mechanisms that can allow regular people to say, I didn't know. Jackson gave concluding remarks at Nuremberg. And it's interesting to pay attention how the tenor of his presentation has changed. The way he understands Nazi Germany seems to have changed radically. Quote, The accused stand before this trial as blood-stained Gloucester stood by the body of his slain king. He begged of the widow, as they beg of you, say I slew them not. And the queen replied, then say there were no slain, but dead they are. If you were to say of these men, that they are not guilty, it would be as true to say that there has been no war, there are no slain, there has been no crime. 